I am of the belief that we are seeing the dawning of a sort of political renaissance. Welcome back, friends. Hello, strangers. And for that one commenter on my last video, um, good day, casual acquaintances. So, a little over a year ago, I sort of made a prediction. That prediction was that incidences and issues such as Gamergate would serve as a catalyst for a broader conversation, a broader debate about the nature of ideology, political ideals, and political identity. Now, a year later, looking back and looking at what's going on presently, I'm pretty sure that I was right. My thinking goes as follows. Back in 2007, and also 2008, while working in the field of politics and electoral politics, I observed on the right wing something of a fissure. A fissure between the libertarians, primarily falling under the banner of Ron Paul supporters, and the more conventional neoconservative types who either actively or unknowingly supported the sort of Bush doctrine, Reagan doctrine idea of American exceptionalism, military interventionism, and all in all, big government for those who want it. While I observed this split, I began wondering how long it would be until I saw something like that on the left. And I believe that is exactly what I'm seeing now. So we can take the instances of censorship and this social justice madness that we see playing out primarily on college campuses and online. And now observing it, it could be enough to where a person who maybe wishes for a more reasonable and mature society would feel a bit frightened by its evolution. An entire generation of young people now demanding that every ounce of speech, expression, media, really anything, be filtered and made to conform to their own emotional comfort about issues on sociological and political ideological levels. And likewise, looking to media outlets um, ranging from the clickbait trash blogs such as Gawker, The Mary Sue, even daily costs, up through the mainstream media, taking on instances such as MSNBC or its right-wing counterpart Fox News, it would seem that extremism, that orthodoxy, is sort of the game of in play everywhere you look. But at the same time, ask yourself this, has faith in media ever been as low as it is now? People have traditionally never trusted lawyers and politicians, but now it seems that media itself has sort of ascended to that level of untrustworthiness. That's rather telling to my perspective, I would say. To look at these instances of media bias, to look at these radical political nutjobs, having their often idiotic ideas such as microaggressions and trigger warnings and safe spaces all affirmed by media outlets and, I guess, also cadres of their own like-minded sycophants coming to their aid whenever they can, and then celebrating victories whenever their offense gets them attention. It could very well seem as though that this is sort of spelling doom for the future, but at the same time, I can't help but notice society's waking up. Let's take for a fun example the recent issue surrounding the Red Pill documentary. Now, it's hard enough to speak about men's issues, let alone the men's rights movement, without being shouted down often by some rainbow-haired, overweight, big-as-beautiful nutjob from Tumblr who swears that we live in a patriarchal rape culture and finds facts and statistics and argument depressive. But here we are now, seeing an entire documentary, a feature documentary, not only achieving its funding goals after having its support withdrawn for it not being the hit piece that the feminist progressive set that was likely behind it had hoped it would be, but also the conversation itself is one which is happening all over. The very fact that people found the notion of 
an objective and unbiased documentary being produced and then being denied funding because of its objectivity enough to actually contribute to not only make its goal but to throw it over its stretch goal. Well, that's impressive. Likewise, outside of simply the issues of men's rights versus feminism, we've even got The Atlantic just recently running a piece asking if the modern idea of safe spaces and the new regressive progressive college activist isn't perhaps the authoritarian that we all know them to be. I've been in this sort of fight for a long time myself. I'll likely make a video about the struggles of father's rights and the issues about family courts very soon, but needless to say, it was that which served as my red pill. Prior to that, I was myself well on the track to being a progressive. Now I still hold a whole slew of liberal ideas and more or less do still identify in that very poorly contrived paradigm of left versus right as one who is a liberal. But getting back to the fun notions of this catalyst and conversation that we've been sort of enjoying over the last year, I found myself growing closer to those on the right than I ever was with those on the left. And of course, speaking in terms of being right and left, this is naturally just a nonsense sort of paradigm that we use to simplify very complicated matters. But I'm taking it in the conversational context to sort of explain where things lie. I find it interesting. These days I'm reading Breitbart and then turning around and reading HuffPo articles. Granted, I read them all with equal amounts of scrutiny, but I find myself enjoying the challenging notions more and more. I've always enjoyed a good argument. Maybe that's why, as I've grown older, that old phrase made famous by Churchill is proving sort of true. If you're not a liberal at 20, you've got no heart. If you're not a conservative at 40, you've got no brain. When I'd first heard this, I had sort of thought that it meant that as one grows older, one grows more jaded and more disaffected by issues, grinding them over to a more reactionary conservative point of view. However, in the modern context, I'm starting to think that perhaps it has more to do with the world changing around oneself. I've not particularly changed my position on most political issues, yet by modern standards of conservative versus liberal, I could be said to be centrist or center-right at this point. And of course, like anybody who disagrees with the modern intersectional feminist nonsense, I've been told I'm a bigoted, right-wing, white supremacist, oppressor class type. The uh, slurs and <laughs> hyperbole never seem to end with them. All the same, though, this change, this shift in the conversation, this modifying of how people view things and how they interact with each other, and the fact that people like myself have honestly grown so tired of having to fight these neo-progressive, Puritan, authoritarian nutjobs, that we've grown sort of nostalgic for the days in which we could just have good old arguments with pro you know, pro-corporate pro nationalist conservatives about whether or not military intervention in a global war state's a good idea, or whether or not trickle-down economics is a sound way of, uh, you know, approaching economic theory. These sorts of things. I miss those fights. I just don't have the time for them anymore. There's just too many batshit crazy idiots out there demanding that myself and everyone else censor everything they say and walk on eggshells so as not to offend the people that they're generally electing themselves to speak for. It's an interesting time. I find that just as the libertarian conservative set seem to split from the mainstream right wing, so too now is something of, as Alum Bakari puts it, a libertarian, uh, or rather a social libertarian, a cultural libertarian. That's another good term for it. But this seems to be sort of a libertarian leftism. An idea that basic fundamental individualist rights, such as speech, the right to be offensive, even, are things which are crucial to the maintaining of a stable, civil, mature society. At the same time, the 
fringe reactionaries, these neo-progressives, which themselves in many ways are sort of a leftist mirror image of the strident puritanical authoritarian neoconservatives. They're driving more and more people away. And as the hard right continues insisting, in, at least in the United States, that a, the maintaining of a global military presence is absolutely crucial, and that the war on drugs needs to continue, and that we must, um, you know, combat profanity and promote Christian values every which way we can. And at the same time, their counterparts on this new emerging neo-progressive left continue insisting with an equally religious fervor that policing speech and thought and media, that homogenizing everything, scrubbing the world of anything that could potentially be offensive, and wrapping it all in emotional bubble wrap to make sure no one ever has to catch a sharp corner or prickly edge of anything. They're driving people out of these wings. They're showing that this paradigm of left and right absolutes is bullshit. And as people seem to be getting driven into what I guess you could call the center, they're meeting each other there. Once staunch conservatives who would never even give a moment's thought to a, a liberal idea are now engaging in conversations in which their minds are more open. They're less interested about promoting specific orthodox ideas about things. And the same goes with liberals. Conversations about economic theory, about history, about national identity, about the nature of immigration and mass human migration. Still, these things still, between people with different opinions, inspire heated debates. But they're not as visceral, I think as they may have once been. They're more about arguing aside, promoting an idea, and, when possible, refining their idea. I suppose, if anything else, we have the central fight for free speech, which has been a war ha that we've had to face on both sides, left and right, over the last, I suppose, 20 years with the right wing for a long time saying anything that offended Christian values, and then later anything that quote-unquote threatened national security, then giving way to this new progressive puritanism which says that anything that could be deemed offensive, microaggressive, or triggering is something that needs to be scrubbed and forgotten from the lexicon forever. I find it interesting that this fight for free speech has driven so many who used to be diametrically opposed to one another together on a similar front to such a point where they'll have arguments between each other about issues of greater import than who is offending whom, and will do so in a way that they enjoy the back and forth, and again, hopefully, refine their ideas. So that's my little rant, I suppose, for right now. I really do believe that we are going to see significant changes, and despite how awful things can seem right now, especially with idiotic moves on the part of mainstream media, and let's say Hollywood, by <laughs> talking about greenlighting a film based upon an unreleased memoir by a spoiled brat who made a failed game and fucked a bunch of journalists to get good reviews. Even though these things, these institutions, seem to be set against the rational thinkers within ourselves and within our friends and our circles, the very fact that people are increasingly reacting to the banality and idiocy that comes out of these sorts of modes of orthodox thought, that's encouraging to me. So, a hearty welcome to all new subscribers. I'm glad that last video landed as well as it did. And, of course, a welcome back to all old ones. Um, I thank you all for giving me your time and listening to my rants and raves about this nonsense, and um, I hope this video lived up to what you were hoping for. Additionally, I've launched a new playlist where I'll be basically posting, you know, videos and compilations from my various travels as a booze journalist. If you're interested in reading any of these reviews, or perhaps seeing or reading up uh, the articles about the travels themselves, you can go to everyjoe.com and find my column, The Beer in Review. Short of that, though, Thank you all for listening, and I look forward to speaking to you again. Cheers.